it's so hard to give advice to young performers, mm -hmm. but the thing I always try to drill in is try to get on stage as often as possible because you never know the night that your lottery ticket is going to be in the audience. And sometimes I think you go, oh, how many people are going to be there? I'm, you know, I could, I'll, I'll go see a movie tonight. I'm not going to go do a show for five people, but you never really know wow. who's going to be there. And now, um, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety. Please join me in welcoming tonight's guest. He is a comedian, writer, producer, actor, and host responsible for so many of your favorite and iconic television moments over the last 20 years. His show, Late Night with Seth Meyers, has started its ninth season. It boasts seven Emmy nominations, but just this year it was nominated for Outstanding Variety Talk Series. Please join me in welcoming Seth Meyers. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, now. Please, please, please. Oh, I feel like I stepped on your applause. That's like the worst thing you can do. No, 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 that was fine. <laughs> I get very uncomfortable if the applause goes on too long, right. so thank you. And you get it every night, so we don't need exactly. to. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you sound like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> you get it every night. <laughs> oh, the Don't clue. expect it. Well, applaud yeah. for your father, children. <laughs> I always wonder if like, there's applause signs that you can bring home. Yeah. You know, and just like hit it repeatedly when you need need that validation. <laughs> that would definitely be a case where it's like, who's cut the applause power line? <laughs> um, this is an audience of SAG after actors. It's lovely to be with you. Thank you all for being here. So I actually always like to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? Oh, uh, I got my, that's such a great question. I got my SAG card doing an episode of Spin City with Charlie Sheen. Yes. And the fascinating thing about it was Charlie Sheen was so lovely and I had the yeah. best time doing it. And then remember all that other stuff happened with yes. Charlie Sheen? And I remember it was like a full week into that where I, cause it seemed like a different person where all of a sudden I was like, oh, I did an episode of Spin City with that man. <laughs> like I completely forgot and didn't put it together. I'm yeah. so glad you said that because I had a similar experience. I spent a day with him for a story and he, like, I t he said something that I thought was so profound. It was my quote on my phone for a while. You know, those old phones when you turn them on and like a quote would come up. And now I'm like, I can't tell anyone that Charlie Sheen was my opening quote on my phone. <laughs> yeah. That sounds psychotic. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you just, I guess you never know. <laughs> I had a, I basically had two or three lines, but I do remember walking over to the director at the end of the taping and saying, thank you so much, I really appreciate this. And he looked at me like, well, you're not supposed to be talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> and my brother very sweetly said, uh, I'm very proud of you and I will never come to another sitcom taping ever again. Really? It's a long night. It's a long night. It is, it is. Yeah, yeah. Now, I actually went to a taping of a show your brother did years ago. Oh yeah? Yes, so he, you, can, you can have that, you can tell him he owes you now. Yes, yes. well, I, I've also been lucky enough to go to a taping okay. he was in, was so it I paid Peep show? I know, I went to okay. a different one that I can't remember the name of that took place in like a diner. Mm. Yeah. Did that one actually make it to air? Because, it not, okay, sadly. there's yeah. so many shows out there so many don't, don't make it. Yep. It's crazy and they're good. Um, so again, congratulations on another fantastic season. And I can't, I have to keep looking at this because I don't totally believe it. It's the show's first nomination for Outstanding Variety Talk Series. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it's such a cliche question, but how did you find out? I, I'm embarrassed because I've already, well, it's very sweet how many people have asked. I uh, was crazy about it. I will admit to getting my hopes up in the past mm. a little bit, and it is disappointing. And so I went for a run and I hid my phone under a bush. <laughs> and I did a loop so I couldn't go back. Like, so I basically like, gave myself a half hour where I couldn't check. And then I got back to my rock and like took my phone out. And it was really exciting because you turned it on. And when you don't get nominated, you get five to seven texts saying you were robbed or, right. you know, very sweet. And let me say, I value those friends a great deal. Those five to seven. When you get it, it's like a hundred. Yeah. I mean, every, everybody loves a winner, yeah. Where are you living that you can leave your phone under a rock for a half hour? I was on, I was on vacation okay. in a very, yeah, like where there were a lot of rocks. <laughs> so even if you were trying to steal a phone, there were so many rocks to look under. 
<laughs> it is pretty awesome that the, the show is being recognized at long last. I mean, yeah. I mean, we, you know, the really nice thing is our writing staff has been recognized in the past multiple times. And as a writer myself, someone who identifies as a writer a lot of the times, it was really important to me that we got recognized for that. It's just that all the producers and, and a, a certain, you know, part of our staff has never had this before. And so it was really great. That's really cool. Did you think back, them. like, did you want to ask them, so what do we do this year that we can do more of? <laughs> no, I mean, I think that that would, we would fumble that if we tried <laughs> to aim for it. I yes. mean, one of the things that has been really nice about this whole journey from the beginning of the show was just to organically improve and sort of follow our instincts as opposed to aim for what we thought people mm. would want. We just did it long enough that we tried to reach a place where people would tune in trusting that the choices we made would be the ones they would enjoy seeing. And that's usually when things work out. It's usually yeah. when it, it, it turns out, weirdly, your authentic self is what people want to see. Even in Hollywood where sometimes <laughs> your authentic self isn't on display. <laughs> Uh, we're obviously going to talk a lot more about the show, but I actually want to go back to the beginning. Okay. Because uh, I, be I believe you were born near Chicago. Yeah. Um, was it Evanston? I was born in Evanston. Okay. Yeah. But you grew up mostly in Michigan. Uh, Michigan and then mostly in New Hampshire. This is a ways away from Hollywood. Yes. At, at what age did you start thinking, you know, that, that acting or performing was something you could do? Were you, were you the kid who did school plays and things like that? I did comedy shows. A crazy thing happened for uh, the kids who lived in, in Bedford, New Hampshire, and we went to, I went to high school in Manchester, New Hampshire, the first thing was that Adam Sandler was from our hometown. And so everybody, I knew people who, older siblings knew Adam Sandler. So that was this first sense. I, th that was my first brush with celebrity, is that there was a celebrity from my hometown. Like, that was so exciting. Then Sarah Silverman is also from my hometown, which is uh, deeply insane. Um, <laughs> You would think that after two people from your hometown get on SNL, that's probably the end. Yeah. It's probably not going to be three of you. Um, but so that, but it really, I genuinely always reflect back on, on realizing, oh, people from here go on to do other things. I, I don't necessarily think at the time I thought it was any guarantee, but I did watch them and say, oh, that's really cool. People that grew up here and went to the same schools I did ended up there. That's so cool. Yes, and I should stress uh, both of them were from the first time I met them, treated you exactly yeah. the way you wanted someone from your hometown to treat you, <laughs> like, oh, you know, uh, under their wing, and, and they're really good people. Were you already into Saturday Night Live, or do you think that that was, I, that, was my, that was the most important show for yeah. me growing up. My parents introduced us to a lot of shows at age-inappropriate times, and, uh, and SNL was a big one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's so funny when I hear people from smaller towns, because the only person to come out of my town was Tanya Harding. Oh, yeah. And I, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And so I, I, I sort of know what it's like, but not really. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Lacking the pride part yeah. of that but <laughs> um that one of my favorite uh, just i'm going to tie it back one of my favorite adam sandler lines in an snl sketch was when nancy kerrigan hosted snl and it was a parade like through new england like a welcome home parade and he i think crawled in the back of her car and was like how'd you get that job <laughs> and she was like what job he goes ice skater how'd you get that job which is the most <laughs> passive aggressive new england thing and she's like i've trained my whole life and he's like must be nice. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to my high school reunion this weekend, so I need to start preparing oh, yes. for, the, for the passive aggressive. Oh, oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's, that's where they break it out. So in addition to Adam and Sarah, were there, were there people that like you sort of grew up watching or maybe careers you thought you could emulate? Or it, just even as an actor, if there were you know, certain movies you loved? I, it wasn't, I mean, I remember the when I think of important movie viewing experience in my life, uh, staying home sick one day, my dad stayed home, and he went to the video store, and he brought back Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And I, I still remember just, first of all, it felt like that, just sharing something with your dad, the, a thing that he had seen before, but you know, sort of presented like, like a Holy Grail. <laughs> um, but very much like, this is so funny, you're gonna love it, and just, there's all these op jokes in the opening credits of that movie, like very subtle writing jokes, and we were just immediately laughing really hard. And just that sort of thing of just laughing at, at um, 
I, well, you know, I, Monty Python always is a perfect example to me of the really silly and the really smart and just sort of like mm -hmm. woven together in this really cool tapestry and always wanting to aim for something like that. And what were, who were the people, I mean, you mentioned your father, but who were influenced, influenced you or like sort of guided you along this path um, and actually encouraged, you know, had, through You comedy. know, I had a lot of really important English teachers, creative writing teachers. I had a lot of teachers, especially in high school, who said things along the lines of like, you were very talented and you were also very lazy. And, <laughs> um, and the two, it would be a great waste because um, lazy, talented people often are ones whose names no one else ever learns. Wow. <laughs> so, um, but I, 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 and so, uh, and that was a really important thing. I, I, cause I was a little bit of a, of a slacker and a procrastinator and, uh, and so I, I was lucky to have people who took me aside and was like, just try a little harder. That's yeah. great. I was very lucky. And then I believe you went to Northwestern. I did. Back, back to Evanston. Yeah. <laughs> um, is that where you sort of discovered improv? Yeah, I went. I, I don't think I'd ever seen improv. We had done sketch comedy things at my high school, sort of sketch comedy nights. I obviously was super tuned in to stand up. But my new student week at Northwestern, the improv troupe called Meow, did a show, and I just watched it and thought, oh, that, I wanna do that. They don't, there's no prep, they're just making it up. <laughs> this is a procrastinator's dream. <laughs> and, and they were so, they were so talented. And um, to this day, I realized how lucky I was to see, you know, again, they were the old college students. And, but they were uh, so great. And I think if I'd have seen a bad college improv troupe, my life would have taken a different path. Yep. But I was like, oh, that's really excellent. And I auditioned for, uh, that troupe was only eight people uh, every year. And I auditioned every year and I only got in my senior year. And I remember when I think of like, the biggest, most important moments of my life, like that getting on that and like walking back and it was like February and the wind was blowing off Lake Michigan and it was so cold and everybody was miserable and it was the first time in my life that I felt like the character in a musical. Like, I felt like the whole, like I just wanted to like spin the whole way home. And, yeah. I mean, I know you've worked with, I think, Improv Olympic yeah. and Boom Chicago. Um, what, what do you think is the secret to good improvisation? Well, I mean, I always think that it helps to come in with a really strong sense of humor, but it really is being able to listen. And, you know, one of the, my great faults as an improviser, which I will fully own up to, is because I think I have a little bit more of a writer's mind, whereas great improvisers, I think, have a performer's mind. I would always go into a scene with a real plan of how I thought it should go. And people would, you know, being <laughs> improvisers, they would take it a different way. And so many of my friends said, could you just show it less on your face? <laughs> <laughs> how disappointed. Uh, and I remember having this really honest moment with a friend about, uh, like this fault of mine. I'm like, you know, I just sometimes, but I wasn't owning it as a fault at the time, I should say. I was saying, I just wish, you know, I come in with a really strong, you know, to use the term, initiation, and I just wish people would follow where I want to take it. And this friend of mine was like very thoughtful and listened. And then the next scene we did together, I walked in and I was, you know, in my head, I'm like, oh, we're going to do this office scene. I'm like, Dan, can you sit down? I'd like to talk to you about your, you know, annual reports or something. And he goes, I will tell you about that, but there's a werewolf outside. <laughs> and I was like, And I was like, why? Why did I share? I told you that in confidence. Good old Dan. Yeah. <laughs> this actually, this is making me wonder, one of my all-time favorite monologues on Saturday Night Live, I think, was during your time. And I'm, I'm starting to wonder if this was your idea, where Steve Buscemi wants to do improv. Buscemi was right before, oh no. You're right, but Shemi was there. But he keeps um, controlling the scene. Yes, he does keep <laughs> controlling the scene. I'm wondering if he, he did it. I know he hosted twice. Was that when I was there? I'm having this really haunting thing happen. First of all, <laughs> I was at SNL for a very long time. And sometimes people will talk about sketches. And I'll say, God, I don't remember that. And then they'll say, you were in it. And I'm like, oh, was I? And then I'll look and I'll say, oh, I wrote it. And so that, yeah. <laughs> Um, That's why I'm like, because it sounds like that sketch, actually, yeah. where he, he tries to end everything where he's in a wood chipper or something. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> 
<laughs> Steve Buscemi is a wonderful person to spend a week with, let me tell you. Yeah. Was it Coach Steve is one of my all-time I did write coach. that. You wrote Coach I Steve? I thought yeah. that was after your time. Yeah. If you guys don't know this, it's... They're trying to, it's a, I should let you explain it. What am I doing? I, I think it's also offensive. So you're making, no, I re -watched, letting me. I rewatched it recently. It, it is not, up. it holds up. Yes. Yeah. It was like around the time of the Jerry Sandusky scandal. And it was Already basically, funny. it was, uh, uh, it was Jason Sudeikis as a coach saying, we've done a full investigation and we're here to announce that coach Steve is not a pedophile. And see, thanks for letting me explain <laughs> it. Coach Steve is, uh, is Steve Buscemi looking yeah. as creepy as possible? Yeah, and he was like, what? Yeah. And, he said, and then it's all the reporters just being shocked. They're like, have you really looked into it? <laughs> and also you can see early signs of Ted Lasso. Well, I think it's like, it, yeah. it very much looks like Ted Lasso. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, Jason Sudeikis channeling Ted Lasso. Yeah, when you Lasso. wrote for Sudeikis, um, you almost always wrote the mustache in. Uh, <laughs> From a very early uh, part of his career, uh, it, you realize that he and a mustache were meant to be together. <laughs> and there's a whole sting that Coach Steve's mom was in on. Yeah, but, but again, nobody, now yeah. I'm sort of going beyond my own memory of the sketch. <laughs> I do remember there were times when you wrote a sketch at SNL and it was harder to do than I like to admit, but at the table read, like that's a real honest bounce yeah. because that is people who have just listened to thousands of sketches. And so when you can write something that has a turn that sort of surprises people and, and Coach Steve, Coach Burt, I think his name is You're Coach You're right, because it's Burt Man. Yeah, yeah, Burt Man. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, Coach Burt was one where I remember. And uh, whenever uh, uh, I wrote something that, that played really hot at the table, I started, uh, it was like joy sweat. I don't know how to explain <laughs> it, but I would, like, I would like flop sweat, but I think it was just the release of like weeks of stress of yeah. not having written a good sketch. And then it was like, oh, oh, they're gonna keep me on for another few weeks. <laughs> I just wonder, I was thinking Coach Steve because of Big Mouth, that's so funny. Um, I was just wondering how you ask someone like Steve Buscemi to do that sketch. To be like, we wrote this sketch where like, you're clearly look like a pedophile. Yeah. <laughs> I, all I know, I don't remember how I asked, I just remembered, uh, I do remember his reaction being like, yeah, great. So, <laughs> I think the more important thing is that uh, Steve Buscemi is in it to win it. Yeah, uh, yeah agreed, total commitment. Um, I believe it was your work with Boom Chicago that yeah. took you to Amsterdam that yes. eventually led to Saturday Night Live? Uh, yeah, sort of, uh, I guess the path was, I was living in Chicago, I was improvising, Boom Chicago were these Chicago guys who moved to Amsterdam and started a Second City style theater. I auditioned for that and pretty much moved out there within a few months of graduating college and spent a couple years there. And then I met this really talented improviser named Jill Benjamin. We came back to Chicago and did a two person show that we were just randomly doing at this very small, very new improv festival. And this woman, Ayala Cohen, who was in the talent department at SNL, was randomly visiting family in Chicago. She wasn't even there on a scouting trip, but I think was on her way to dinner and said, well, I might as well pop into an improv festival. So it is a real reminder. It's so hard to give advice to young performers, mm -hmm. but the thing I always try to drill in is try to get on stage as often as possible because you never know the night that your lottery ticket is gonna be in the audience. and. Sometimes I think you go, oh, how many people are going to be there? I'm, you know, I could, I'll, I'll go see a movie tonight. I'm not going to go do a show for five people, but you never really know wow. who's going to be there. Who was in your Boom Chicago group? Because it's like every person was an all star. It was, it was nuts. I was there with my brother and Ike Barinholtz and uh, Jason Sudeikis and Kay Cannon and Jordan Peele, who has not been heard from again. Very sad. <laughs> <laughs> Very sad. We thought he had talent, but. Uh, <laughs> Something went wrong. No, uh, uh, and that I mean that's just uh, that's just the the tip of the iceberg. There was all and you know Brendan Hunt and Joe Kelly who you know created Ted Lasso with Jason. They were there at the same time as us. And yeah, it was a uh, Amber Ruffin uh, who's on our show now. Yeah, she's give it up not for Amber. here. Yeah, she's not. <laughs> uh, I know when I say Amber Ruffin, there's an yes. expectation that they'll come out. Uh, <laughs> no, but it was a uh, it was a uh, you know sometimes. You're lucky to end up getting, you know, any job where getting paid to be an actor is uh, obviously a great, a great success. But when you find your way to a place at the same time as other talented people, it just raises the bar for, for what you need. And, and it's amazing how much uh, 
your skills improve when you're around people who yeah. have, which is sometimes I think counterintuitive. Sometimes I think uh, as an actor, you show up someplace and you, you feel great when you're like, oh, I'm the best one here. This is going to be great. But it turns out being the best one there means that you probably aren't going to get any better. Right. Yeah. yeah. I used to think that there was only like a finite amount of success. Yeah. And if someone I knew had it, yeah. they were taking it from me. And now you realize it's quite the opposite. Like that success spreads. A friend of mine who's a very uh, wonderful actor told me a story about how he was in a play and his co-star was crushing. And he said to the director, the director said, you seem a little off. And he said, I got to admit, you know, the co-star, he's, uh, I feel like he's the one who's scoring. And the director basically said, like, if he was worse, do you think it would make you any better? And it's the truth, That's right? Great. Like, we, we get caught up comparing ourselves to the other thing. But, like, are we actually... I mean, we should want to be better. We shouldn't want to just look better mm -hmm. in comparison. Like, you want to actually improve your own skill. Oh, I might steal that. That's really good. Yeah, I feel bad because <laughs> I've obviously stolen it, too. <laughs> you could say that actor I was... I feel like... I know I should, but now I don't know if I should. But he's really good. <laughs> well, because, because he's, the he's lesson worked. really good. It worked. It was Charlie the lesson Sheen, worked. right? What? It was Charlie Sheen. It was Charlie Sheen, yeah. <laughs> Um, I actually heard that you held the record at Boom Chicago. Oh, sorry, Boom. Yeah, no, it is yeah, Boom, Boom Chicago, Chicago, but you're you in it, Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah. Um, for doing the most shows in a week. Oh, Are that's I, I, that's very possible. I was uh, <laughs> by the time I, for all my laziness in my high school <laughs> days, like once I actually got a job in comedy, I I don't think I've ever been outworked. I've I've often. Uh, not been the funniest person, but I don't think I've ever uh, let anybody work harder than me. It's the other interesting thing is they tried to come up with a name when they went to Amsterdam that just sort of, they wanted Chicago in the title and they wanted something like, you know, <laughs> excitement. So they went, you know, so it's Boom Chicago and uh, the logo was like a bomb. And, um, and uh, it was so funny how often Dutch people would mispronounce it or say it wrong. Like, we would do, like, festivals, and they would introduce, and they're like, please welcome to the stage, Chicago, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> and that is not an offensive Dutch accent. It's hyper, it's very hyper accurate. accurate. Very yeah. accurate. So can you sort of walk us through the Saturday Night Live audition process? Because I've heard... Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Do they tell you, come with impressions? They did. I remember, first of all, just to timestamp the world when I first got the call, which I think was maybe 1999. I ended up getting hired in 2001, and I think it was about a two-year process. But they said, make an audition tape. And I recently saw it, and it's crazy, because you needed to find a friend with a mini cam, and then, like, stand. I stood in his shitty bedroom. There's, like, a Chester drawer, like, you know, just, like, <laughs> awful. Like, flat lighting, terrible. Then... I mean, I, you guys all remember, but like, then you'd have a tiny tape. Yes. Then you'd have to take that to a store and be like, can you put this on a big tape? <laughs> and then they'd be like, come back in a week. <laughs> you know? And you'd come back in a week and you have like a VHS. And I remember like just putting a VHS tape with like a masking tape with my name on it. And they said, you know, uh, they were like five minutes, uh, you know, maybe do three impressions, three characters. And I also uh, take instruction very seriously. So when they were like, <laughs> I don't know, five minutes, three characters, three impressions, whatever you want. That's exactly what I did. I think like five, right. maybe five minutes and two seconds. But um, I sent off a tape and then about a year later they said, send in another tape. And so I did a whole new one. And then they called me in to New York City and I, yeah, it was summer of 2001 and I went in and you audition on the stage. That's the trippiest part of it. So you stand where, you know, I, the, I stood there to audition and I did not stand there again until, you know, 18 years later when I hosted. Wow. <laughs> um, and so you're, you know, and you can see yourself on the monitors and you're just looking and you re it's the most iconic piece of real estate in comedy is that home base. And I remember this very nice man uh, named Bobby who uh, was doing sound when I was there, he came just to check my mic before I did it. He goes, so uh, they're gonna count down from five and then you uh, you just uh, give it a go and you start that. I'm like, great. And I'm like, and so they'll count down from five? 
And he's like, yeah, they'll count down from five and then you can start your thing. And I'm like, okay, so they'll count down. And I just didn't want him to leave. Like I just, I knew when he left it had to start. And so I was just like a crazy person who would just like ask, literally say what he just told me twice. Like it was new information. I'd be like, okay, great. And then five and they're gonna do all of them. It'll be like four, <laughs> three, two, and then, and he was really sweet. And I, I, I had great affection for him. I mean, he was a lovely guy the whole time I worked there, but he, he really did like, I mean, I think he had seen the fear in my eye. It was not the first time he'd seen it, but he's like, it'll be great, it'll be great. And then he, uh, he left. And I did, uh, I did that audition, and I should also say, I did not know Rachel Dratch before I auditioned, but I knew a friend of Rachel Dratch's, and I, they set us up on a phone call to talk before I did it. And she gave a very valuable, not piece of advice, but just something to think when you were on stage, which I then tried to give to every person who ever asked me, which is she said, no one's gonna laugh. That's what I heard. And, but it's great to say no one's gonna laugh because then if you just get a few laughs, you're up there thinking, I am fucking killing it. <laughs> and so that, and that's how I did get a few laughs. And, uh, and uh, I, I never felt like I was particularly good at auditioning and I'd you know, gone through a pilot season out here and, it had, I'd always felt wooden and, and not very loose or good. Whereas this, you wrote your own stuff. Mm -hmm. And I did feel like I had been writing for myself for a long time. And so that gave me a slight advantage versus maybe going in to read a pilot script. But I walked outside and I just, I remember like sitting down and just wanting to sob because of just the, the burden of, my biggest fear was that I would have this one opportunity uh, for SNL and wouldn't feel proud of the audition. So I, which I did. And then, you know, obviously, I was lucky enough to get the job too. And then did you dance in the streets or twirl in the streets? I was in, so I was living in LA at the time and I remember uh, being like in Westwood for some uh, unknown reason. And, uh, <laughs> and like, I remember uh, getting the call and just like being overwhelmed. Yeah. And then really the uh, cool thing about SNL is it's, you know, when Jennifer Anderson got uh, friends, right? That like, that was gonna change her life. But at the time you're just telling your friends, like I'm on this new show and you have to explain it. But like SNL, you get to tell people, everybody knows, your parents know, your grandparents probably know. Like they all know what it means. They know who's been on the show. So I would argue there's no better show to get for that moment of like, guess what happened. Um, and, uh, I remember the greatest phone call was calling my mom, telling her I got it, and my mom, who's a lovely woman, school teacher, uh, my mom said, no fucking way. <laughs> and then, and then when I told her she couldn't tell my dad she, and she couldn't ruin it. And I didn't have a lot of faith in her ability to keep it from my dad. <laughs> but then a few hours later, he got home from work and I called my dad and I told him I got it. And, uh, and I, he goes, he got it. And she went, I know. And then my dad immediately moved on from me getting SNL to talk about how impressed he was that my mom had kept the secret. <laughs> Like to this day, he's like, she can you for four hours she knew and didn't tell me. That's the impressive part. That's the impressive part, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's what dads have to do is immediately move on to another thing. I'm curious, was, was the hope to always get Saturday Night Live or w w how did you start envision? I don't, I mean, I think that was, I, I don't think I ever dared to hope for something yeah. like that. I mean, I hoped to, you know, I moved out here obviously for the purposes of, of getting a job in TV, but that was, yeah, beyond my wildest dreams. And then the scary, almost sad part about getting SNL is you, I feel like you celebrate for a day and then you immediately, and I know from talking to people more after the fact, sadly, than during, because I think it would have been more healthy to talk to my fellow castmates about it during, but as soon as you get it, you start worrying it's gonna get taken away, right? right? You know, you're just so, because you show up and you're like, I'm the new Will Ferrell. And then you're like, oh no, they have a Will Ferrell. They don't need, you know, <laughs> uh, I gotta do something else. And, and I think that you, you realize that it's the beginning. You know, you think it's the, I don't know, the end of your life, bef like it's the end of a struggle, but it's just the beginning yeah. of a new one. Yeah. Uh, with a lot higher stakes and a lot tougher competition. So, um, 
it took a few years, uh, probably five years, before I actually felt like, okay. And I had a great time those first five years, but I, I definitely felt like when I think back to those years, I, I feel a little bit like I was falling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it just felt like that. Uh, you mentioned before that you had done some auditions out yeah. here before Saturday Night Live and, yeah. and you didn't enjoy the process. Right. I really didn't. <laughs> Did you have those nightmare auditions that actors always hear about? Yeah. I, well, the, the best one was I got, a, I, I think I networked, ten, I got the, the farthest I ever got and then I, I didn't get it. And uh, I, I did, you know, I do sometimes feel for your representation when you, you ask them, like, can you just find out what, ha-? you know, and yeah. sometimes there's just not an answer. And I called my manager and I'm like, could you just reach out and find out what happened? And he called back and he goes, yeah, they just, they said you were just bad. <laughs> Thanks for sugarcoating it. That's amazing. I um, did, I should also say it's been a nice to, because I've gotten to talk to each of them. I, in that one year, I remember I auditioned for uh, Jason Alexander and Kelsey Grammer, who at the time were already, you know, they were already those people. And it, they were both uh, really nice and polite. And so it's been cool like to have like a yeah. later act in my life to say, I just want to let you know that as a young person, like that was a really memorable thing. Yeah. So. Uh, we actually have an audience question that sort of applies to this okay, from great. Mary Renard. Uh, I'm sorry if I I'm mispronounce Mary. anyone's name. Um, wants to know how you broke into comedy writing specifically, and then did you have an agent or manager that got you in the door? I So I would say that SNL was my break, and that happened independently. But I did, the two-person show that ultimately got me SNL, someone saw it in Chicago, and that was someone from L.A. And so we moved out to L.A. because we had a manager, my partner and I, Jill. But we were really just doing auditions. We weren't trying to get jobs as a writer. And I would say the real reason, the real uh, reason my writing career took off is that my acting career did not. <laughs> in that everybody always says, oh, you started as a writer on SNL. And I have to remind them, I started as a cast member. I wasn't a writer on SNL. And it wasn't until my fifth year on the show that Lauren said, maybe you should just be a writer. <laughs> oh. Um, uh, and, and I really had, I mean, he wasn't wrong. And I should, I've always said this, that, you know, you only work at SNL if you can figure out how to write for yourself. And I managed to like grind it out. But then in, you know, my first three or four years on the show, all of a sudden, you know, I think my second year, Fred Armisen, Will Forte, then all of a sudden it's Hader and uh, Sudeikis and Andy. And when I was writing sketches as a writer, I wanted to put them in it more than I wanted to put me in it because I wanted it to work. And I realized, well, if I think that, I, you know, it would be unfair for me to wonder why, you know, other people yeah. are thinking it too. But it, the way it all worked out is that was also when I got update and, uh, and so I, I had a really, that was the lovely part of my time at the show where I had, I was lucky enough to be on camera, but I also I could really, the rest of the week I could focus on, on writing for that really talented group. I want to talk about that, but I do want to point out you did some really killer impersonations on the I show. Did before that. Yes, I did not. I do them. Did. No, no, I'm yes, an did. excellent uh, impressionist now. I... Like probably the best working impressionist. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I... Because like now on my show, I literally put no thought into it. And I'm like, these are pretty good. Whereas like at SNL, I used to overthink things so much. And I remember like playing John Kerry, I would tape John Kerry off TV and like list, like walk. I mean, you want to start your day off with a, a skip in your step. Listen to John <laughs> Kerry. <laughs> like the, the droning John Kerry. Uh, as you walk. And then like, I, d I would like do them and I would try to be like technical. And when I look at it, because I will say like, I'm, I'm joking obviously, like I, all my impressions now are, are very slapdash, but they come from a place of joy. Yeah. And I think the audience can tell they come from a place of joy. And ultimately, that's what the fun impressions at SNL are, are the people where you're like, oh, they're really enjoying doing this. More than like, oh, you know, that really sounds like the person. Well, I think asking you to do John Kerry is setting you up for failure. First yes. of all, like what's yeah, yeah, funny yeah. about that? You did a great Sean Penn. I don't think it, I, but I really, I had a nice moment with Sean Penn. Really? I did. Sean Penn was on my show. So we did, 
It was based on the Oscars where Sean Penn got on the stage and I think Chris Rock made a joke about Jude Law. Yeah. And then Sean Penn got up and like defended Had no Jude Law. no humor about it, yeah. It was humorless. And so we did Sean Penn's Celebrity Roast. <laughs> and it was an SNL sketch where Joe Kelly's idea, who was one of the creators of Ted Lasso, and it was just people would do roast jokes and then I would come out and explain why that was uncalled for. And, uh, and so it was humorless. And, uh, and so then Sean Penn was on my show. And I'm, I mean, Sean Penn is Sean Penn. It's really, I mean. And uh, I brought up that sketch. And he had never seen it. But oh, he, yeah. the, the segment producer said Seth wants that. So he watched it. And he said uh, he liked the sketch a lot. And it made him retroactively feel bad about how humorless he'd been at those Oscars. <laughs> I just remember at one point someone's making a harmless joke and they cut to you as Sean Penn and you're just shaking with rage. Yeah. <laughs> that was, uh, yes, that was, I think that was, again, that was an impression that was more prosthetics than anything else. <laughs> you also did Donald Trump Jr. I did way do back Donald Trump day. Jr., yeah, and that's, why, that's when our friendship started, I think. Uh, <laughs> you might not get him, but I get him. I was him. Uh, we have a question from both Max and Travis about your impressions. Okay, great. Um, well, Travis wants you to know that your time at Impression Camp paid off. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Um, and you sort of talked about what your process is for perfecting an impersonation or a voice. Um, but what is your favorite and least favorite impressions? And can you talk a little bit more about the process in developing that? There's no process. <laughs> um, it is literally in the moment deciding to do an impression. And it really, I will say our impression. My impression work took off during the pandemic when there was no audience. Um, <laughs> like, it was amazing the courage I had all of a sudden to just, like, start doing half-baked impressions. And then, by the way, like, then we've kept the energy of what our pandemic shows were when the audience came back because we had this really nice realization of, oh, these are the same people that were watching it during the pandemic, and, and they're still here. Um, they haven't been turned off. I, I had a, a Vince Vaughn impression that's not good, but I really like it. It's just buddy, buddy, buddy. And, <laughs> and someone pointed out, I don't think Vince Vaughn has ever said buddy, buddy, buddy. I don't think it's like an existing, but it just sounds like something yeah. he'd say. Buddy, buddy, buddy. And so I really like that. <laughs> um, we also have a question from Jamie Scurry, I think. Scurry. Uh, wants to know what's your favorite Saturday Night Live sketch? Of all time? Is Jamie here? All time, or that you did, I think. or that I did. I think the the I wrote the Amy and Tina Palin and Clinton sketch, yeah. and uh, and by the way, like when you write a sketch on SNL, other people uh, pitch in. Like it's very rare to write something without help, and and there were a lot of great lines in it that came um, um, from other people. But I remember that night. I usually watched sketches from under the bleachers sort of <coughs> through my fingers that I wrote. And uh, mostly because <coughs> even if it had gone well undressed, then your fear was that it would go worse at air, like, or that they would drop a line, or the camera would miss a cut, or the audience would be colder. That was because it was the two of them. And I had no, like, doubt about their, you know, they were going to elevate it beyond what it deserved based on the script. But I usually watch in the back, and I just remember walking out, like I literally watched it in the center of the floor, like, shower me! Shower me with your laughter! Throw your garlands! And I think there's only been like five times uh, where I was at SNL that I felt that confident that a sketch would go that well. I hope Coach Burt was one of them. Coach Burt was one of them. Okay, good. Coach good, good. Burt is one, very few, the hardest thing is the ones you could look back at and not wish you'd done something differently. Mm. I, you know, it's the, the downside of rewatching them is, oh, I can't believe I couldn't beat that line. Yeah. And so, but there are a few that are uh, just really hold up. I'm glad you cited the Palin-Clinton sketches because I was actually going to ask specifically about them because it felt like, and this just may be perception, but sort of halfway through your tenure at Saturday Night Live, you sort of pivoted to more political I don't know if you've always been good at mixing commentary and comedy, or that just 
came I about. I think I grew into it. I mean, I certainly always felt engaged politically and, and you know, was somebody who followed the news, but it didn't seem like a role that you took on, especially, again, as a cast member. You know, I wasn't brought in to be a political writer. And then just out of necessity, I sort of found myself writing them more and more. But that was... I think after that, it just gave you the confidence to try more and more things. By the way, you know, there were plenty that, you know, were real lead balloons. Um, it's a, <laughs> it's a, the hardest part of the show yeah. to do, like that first out of the gate, you know, writing about the news, and sometimes the news can be pretty dry, and sometimes you find yourself wishing the show could open with a different kind of sketch. Um, but uh, I think it's very hard to... Uh, tell a man who's been running a show for 40 years, I don't think you're doing it right. I don't think this show's gonna make it. <laughs> Did you have to also get used to the idea, because I know there's this subset of people who think that you shouldn't talk about politics and comedy. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I don't think, I mean, I, I hear that probably more now but at SNL, like that was, I think yeah. SNL always had that. So that was never an issue at SNL of uh, you should talk less about politics. You know, there was a little bit of like, you know, which I've always found um, uh, it, both in comedy and journalism, like if you're going to make one joke about them, you got to make one joke about them. I don't find that math right. to be particularly um, enjoyable or uh, successful. But, you know, you try to, you know, if anybody's acting, you know, in a ridiculous way, you certainly should call them out no matter their party, but you can't just, you know, try to even the ledger. But that was never a problem at SNL, no. So you, when you took over hosting Weekend Update, because I've heard that this is like the most desirable job on the show. Everybody For me wants it was, update. after everybody made it clear they didn't like when I played other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, Basically, was... Lauren was like, maybe you should be you. <laughs> well, that was my question. Did you feel like you were giving up something at no, the same no, time? No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I wanted it uh, so badly. Yeah. I mean, almost as soon as I started on the show, I had a sense that that would be a place where I could find some purchase and, and feel as though I wasn't grasping for straws every week. I always... <laughs> Andy Samberg had a sketch... It was a kid in like an NFL announcer's booth who had, was like brought up as because he won a contest and after every play he would say, that'll move the chains. <laughs> and <laughs> That was a good Andy. Yeah, yeah I do a very good Andy. I'll do, yeah, I'll, I'll do more Andy for you. But then he did uh, that'll move the chains. It was a perfectly fine sketch. And then he came into my office like, you know, six weeks later and he goes, uh, I think we're going to do another That'll Move the Chains. And I went, another? Because it didn't strike me as like a recurring character. And I went, another? He goes, I'm sorry, we don't all have update every week. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went back and hosted in, I think, 2018? Yeah, maybe, yeah. What, what was it like to be on the other side? It was crazy. It was so crazy going back. I thought... It was very humbling because I, you know, haven't worked there for as long as I worked there and being head writer and thinking I really understood the bones of the place. You're seeing it from the other side. Yeah. Even having worked there, it is overwhelming hosting that show. And I've said this before, but I retroactively wanted to go and apologize to every host I'd ever worked with because I, in the back of my head, you know, sometimes you would, you know, one of the producers would say, can you go talk to the host? They're... They don't. They have some notes on this sketch, and I would just walk the whole way down the hallway. I'm like, "You're fucking telling me I'm going to be You don't think you think you know this better than me?" And then I go and be like, "Oh, you have some problems." And then, and then I hosted, and I just remember being in my dressing room, being like, "Oh no, I have some problems with this sketch." <laughs> and I, I just realized I'm like, "Why well, was such a dick that I didn't have any like empathy for what yeah. people go through?" And like, and again, like. My whole backstory is sketch comedy, and so many people who host SNL, it's not. And uh, and it's amazing how well everybody does. But it, so it was it was a real it was a real trip to go back and do it. I mean, I think it's everyone's dream to host Saturday Night Live at some point, even if they're not a performer. Um, what do you think makes a good host? What advice would you offer someone coming in? I mean, it's it's so I mean, because part of it is you know, and I think one of the. I, the 
the same limitation I had as a cast member was a limitation I think I had as a host, which is there's nothing about me that inspires a lot of like ideas like what is like what should Seth play? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> literally was most famous on the show for playing myself. Um, so it's great when people come with like a, like either a wide breadth of film roles over their career or somebody who's like unique in the way that say Peyton Manning is unique or a pop star that you aren't used to seeing do other things. But I would just say that to any host, I always say, you know, just trust the week. And it seems overwhelming, but the great thing is it just, it constantly narrows down. Like there's all this garbage on like Tuesday and Wednesday, but it keeps getting down. And then the most fun 90 minutes of your entire week is air. Because even dress can sometimes be two hours and 15 minutes. And you, in the middle of it, you're like, oh, this one stinks, this one stinks. But then all of a sudden it's air and you go, oh, this is a really fun 90 minutes. This is gonna be a blast. Before we move on to your show, I actually want to talk about some of your acting work that you did Thank while you, you were. Yeah. <laughs> I was very disappointed there's not a single photo of it in the walls of this building. <laughs> well, actually, I, th I could be wrong, but I think your first movie was not only a great movie, but you were the lead. See this movie? Oh, thank you. Yes. Do, uh, do you not like this movie? I do. Out I, I, I love, love that movie. movie. Thank okay. you very much. I mean, very few people have seen it, um, but it was uh, a wonderful experience. Shot it here and in Montreal. Uh, met a lovely, wonderful people. Uh, John Cho. I got John to, Cho's your co star. You co -star. might have top billing over John Cho. Uh, yeah, incredible. That's how crazy <laughs> the world was at the time. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was really exciting and fun, and I, I, I loved every second of it. So, for anyone who doesn't know, it's you guys are pretending that there's a movie that exists mm -hmm. that you're trying to take to a film festival, but there's no actual movie. Yeah, we're trying to shoot yes. a movie at the film festival in time to show it at the film yes. festival. Yeah. <laughs> and Pat Oswalt in it. It's a really Pat great Oswalt, cast. Jim Piddick, the wonderful yeah, I Jim, love Jim Jessica Pittick. Paré, uh, Justin Gilsig. Yeah. So this is the, this is like it, it's actually like a really really fascinating performance because there's so much going on. How did you land it? Was it off of Saturday Night Live or even? I had I was on SNL at the time. So I think it was maybe my first year and this is, I think I can say this because things have worked out all right for this actor <laughs> that auditioned right after me. Ooh. I remember seeing, or maybe right before me, I saw him coming out on my way in. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he'll be bummed because I do think his career would have gone better if he got it. <laughs> it was Bradley fucking Cooper. <laughs> Oh, man. You think those that director yeah. doesn't think every day, like, <laughs> I could have had Bradley Cooper? <laughs> Bradley Cooper could have been Green Lantern, too. There's a lot of things he went out for he didn't get. I think the good news is we've gotten a lot of really great Bradley Coopers. Yes. Yeah, I don't feel like we've been denied a great Bradley Cooper work. So you beat Bradley Cooper for the role. Look, I mean, <laughs> should I have an Oscar? Probably. <laughs> Uh, no, but I, yeah, I just went and auditioned, and it was, but like that was a very, uh, in the end, seemed like, um, I don't know, everything after that, I, cause I kind of, that felt like a perfect like first step for maybe yeah. my, whatever it was, my first or second summer, um, from SNL, I'm like, oh great, I'm gonna do this indie, and then I'll do a bigger movie and a bigger, and then that part didn't really happen, <laughs> yeah. But you did some great movies, like I love American Dreams. American actually. Dreams is super great, uh, Jennifer Coolidge. Yeah. I, mean, I got to basically on. spend do all my scenes with Jennifer Coolidge. I also um, I did a scene with Hugh Grant, which is very exciting. I had auditioned as Hugh Grant for SNL, I so I felt very did. yeah. yeah. I, I had a great connection to him that he did not have with me. But um, <laughs> uh, only I just mean that like I looked up to him, and why would he look up to me? And um, we've since I he's a wonderful talk show guest, and uh, but it was really funny because we were in this scene together in American Dreams, and. Uh, I walked, I got a still of it. We were literally the scene together and uh, I walked into his dressing room and I'm like, any memory? And he was like, none. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, it's just interesting because once you started doing your show, you get really known as yourself. Yeah. So you start playing yourself in movies. Although you were fantastic playing yourself in Late Night with Mindy Kaling. Yeah, that was yeah. really fun. <laughs> um, Mindy and I have been friends for a long time. She guest wrote at SNL, that's the first time. I met her, which is now probably, oh my goodness, 15 years ago. Um, and uh, I'm such a huge fan of hers. Uh, and that was really just a delight. Do you think, though, that people assume it's easy to play yourself and it's really not? Or is it easy? It's pretty easy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
I most I'm not gonna be like, yeah, you really, I mean, the, that wasn't, the Seth Meyers you saw in Late Night was a different Seth Meyers, no. <laughs> But when you chose to do your show, which I guess started in 2014, mm -hmm. is that right? Um, was there a part of you that felt like you might be walking away a little bit from acting because you're gonna be known so iconically? I already felt as though really? I had walked away from acting. And I didn't, I, I didn't feel a great amount of loss from that. I do feel like I had given it a really uh, good shot, but I also, I'm not just saying this, I really, spending those years at SNL and watching just what my colleagues could do. And those were often the other guys who were auditioning for those parts. And to see how, and I'm not saying it comes easy to any of them, but it certainly looks natural when you watch Jason or Bill or Andy or, or Will or Fred on camera. And I always thought, oh, I don't, even my dad once said, uh, not to harken back to his sort of hard truths, <laughs> But he goes, you know what's funny? Some actors you see in movies and they're always their characters, but every time I see you, I'm just like, that's Seth. <laughs> Thanks, Pretty Dad. fair, pretty fair. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it, I, I, to be honest, I, I don't know what I thought my post-SNL plan was, yeah. but I didn't, at the time that this, but late night came along, I did not think that it was gonna be like movies and stuff like that. Were you, did you sort of have your eye on late night or was it a total shock? No, it was a total shock. I don't know why. It does seem now like I probably should have been less shocked by it. But um, I was, you know, really at the time I felt, and it's a reminder that sometimes when you start feeling comfortable, it probably is time to move on. And, you know, I'd been at SL for a really long time and I was head writer and I was doing update and those were the two things that I'd always wanted to do there and I was feeling pretty good about it. And then it all happened really quickly. I think, you know, it was a crazy, now it's been, you know, it's been so sort of uh, calm for basically <laughs> like eight years, but it was, you know, it was Conan's job and then Jay was on at 10 and then Jay yeah. took Conan's, then Jimmy, and then Jay all of a sudden said, I'm gonna leave and Jimmy moved up and there was this opening and, um, yeah, it didn't even occur to me, even though the guy who had had the job last had had my current job <laughs> before me. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and so it, it happened fast and it just seemed like as soon as Lorne floated it, I thought, oh yeah, that would be the thing to do. Because wow. I just thought the biggest fear, I think for everybody post SNL, is that the next thing will be boring. And uh, I didn't think late night would be boring. And I would love to talk about how you initially assembled that writer's room yeah. because I heard it was very democratic, which you don't find too often in, in this industry. <laughs> well, I mean, we wanted, you know, I think the thing I learned from my time at SNL and putting together a writing staff there is you don't want to get someone who does a thing that someone else does well because then that sort of breeds resentment because you have two people trying to, you know, write sketch X where, if you have somebody who's good at sketch X, get somebody who does Y well, and then get somebody who does Z well. And so that's one of the things we reached out for. And we were also looking for people who we thought would be good performers. And so that's how we ended up with somebody like Amber Ruffin or Connor O'Malley was someone we saw at you know, New Faces in Montreal and immediately it occurred to us that he would be a, a totally different thing because he and I are almost nothing alike. And then we also, you know, we found a, you know, people who had funny Twitter feeds. And I remember we, there was a uh, Brian Donaldson who still writes for us. We brought him in for a meeting. We, you know, basically DM'd him on Twitter. He had really funny tweets. And we, just our assumption was that we, he was um, a comedy writer. I don't know why. Yeah. It was just really funny tweets. And then we brought him in and he was just working IT in Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> and uh, I, we interviewed him in New York. And I remember on his way out, he was like, hey, uh, do you know where um, I can get like a, a uh, little Statue of Liberty for my daughter. And uh, I remember our head writer, Alex Bays, was like, uh, literally any store in Midtown. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, and so it was cool. And you know, one of the, the really exciting things about starting one of these shows, it's the only time where you have, you know, 12 open slots. And so, you know, it's like you putting together the Avengers. You're like, oh, one of these and one of these and one of these. And then it's really exciting. Then the reality is, and it's not a bad reality, we have a writing staff we love, but the turnover is not, you, you know, yeah. it, you, it's almost like maybe once a year you get to bring in somebody new, but, uh, but just to show you the length of time that the show's been on, like we hired somebody from Twitter and I think our last writer, um, who's Jeff Wright, who's on camera a lot, 
was somebody who was on TikTok. And that was just, again, uh, Mike Shoemaker, our producer, saw him on TikTok, reached out. He definitely thought it was a joke um, <laughs> that this old man was like, we'd like you to come in for a meeting. He's like, okay. <laughs> But he was just like living in Florida, doing these really good TikToks, and the next thing, he was working for us. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of questions Great. about the correction segment oh, good. on your show. Uh, um, Justin wants to know if some of the mistakes are intentional. Like, do you No, put we never, thank people? you for asking that, Justin. Um, that, I mean, sadly, I don't have to make intentional mistakes. It turns <laughs> out we can fill up a week of corrections just by the mistakes that uh, we make accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> This is a very precise question from Minelta. Is that, did I get that right? Okay, cool. Um, it's her favorite segment. Uh, she, can you elaborate further on the mug issue? Yeah, thank you, Brad. <laughs> so we wanted to make a corrections mug, and we spent a lot of time working on the design of it. And so it turns out there's like a third-party merchandiser who can just make whatever NBC stuff they want and put it online, <laughs> like NBC license it out. So here we are, like this like long six month process of me looking at these different mugs and like, no, 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 the ears have to be pointier on the jackal. And then meanwhile, someone else is like, we made a mug and it's for sale now. <laughs> and so, and then we had to like say, you can't sell those mugs. And um, <laughs> I definitely think the NBC merch people want to kill us because I don't think they've ever had a show call up and be like, we have more notes on the mug. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy to say it's the highest selling mug in really? the history of, there's a weird name, the, the NBC studio shop. We've sold out two runs of the mugs, guys. That's a big deal. We're talking Today Show mugs. Nope. Dunder Mifflin, you think, but nope. Do, did on a day like that, like corrections or something like I joke Seth can't tell, are those yeah. things that just really kind of happen organically a lot of the time? Yeah, I mean, I should say, credit where credit is due, joke Seth can't tell, organic in that Jenny, especially Jenny made this observation that Jenny, you know, would write all these jokes about being a lesbian, and I would always say, Jenny, I can't tell these jokes. <laughs> Like, they're great. Like, they're great monologue jokes. But, like, from your, uh, like, it will be insane if I tell these jokes. Like, they're not going to work. And then she said to Amber, what if Seth just read the setups of these jokes and you and I read the punchlines? And, um, and it was that I kind of idea where you're immediately like, oh, that's great. And it's worked great every time. And, and you know, it obviously has helped a great deal by the fact that Amber and Jenny are such charismatic performers. And, because a lot of those punchlines are very groany and they managed to charm their way through it. I, um, whenever we read, because again, I always, we, we just let them do the jokes they want to do and I say, Amber, I feel like that one might be tough sledding. She's like, I'll be fine. And I'm like, she always is. Um, she's so charming. And, uh, but then Corrections was way more organic and I think born of the sort of insanity that we felt doing the show during the pandemic and doing it just for our crew and also just engaging more with the online audience because there was no other audience yeah. and uh and people being nitpicky about stupid <laughs> stuff the it, the launching point was that i remember you, a lot of people there's a lot of adults who are way too into legos and, <laughs> yes. and like you can't say legos they're like it's not legos it's lego blocks or lego bricks yeah. Well, I've only heard brick. I've heard you can't yeah, say Yeah, so you can't be like, I stepped on a Lego. They're like, no, 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 no. And so I, I basically tried to address it in the body of the show, but I kept getting it wrong, a little bit wrong. And they'd be like, actually. And, uh, and so then I said to Shoemaker, uh, hey, on Thursday after the show, I don't want this to be in the body of the show. I'm just going to, I'll make notes. And I, I've read through all the YouTube comments of the week, and I'll just correct everything I got wrong. And, uh, and I think the first one was maybe you know, three and a half minutes. And now they're regularly 20 minutes. Uh, really? Yeah. Because it's grown into something else where it feels like I'm doing an open mic stand-up set about the show. <laughs> and uh, the most heartbreaking thing is how many people in the YouTube comments of Corrections will say, I only watch the show now to find things wrong for this. <laughs> I'm like, that's not the spirit of it. 
Joke's on them, though. They're yeah, watching. They're watching. I'll take it however you get it. Yep. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I, I always wonder, because I'm not surprised you're good at the sketch comedy. I'm not surprised you're good at... I, I don't even know if you call it a monologue, because you deliver it from secret. Yeah. So. Don't, yeah, we do still call it a monologue. Yeah, it but is. Yeah. 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 Um, what was the learning curve on interviewing people? I will say that improv skill that we were talking about, being a good listener, like that's the most important thing. Because the longer you do it, you realize it's just a hundred different kinds of guests. Some people want to come out and they want to perform to the audience and other people want to just really lock in on you. Some people need help getting from one store to the other. Some people just need as little as you can do. And the thing you learn the more you do the show is how quickly you can adjust to who they are, mm -hmm. as opposed to try to get them to adjust to who you are. They have enough to do. And, you know, people, sometimes guests, especially in, you know, being 12.30 show, one of the nice things is I think we have a lot of people who are doing their first talk show ever. Wow. And when it's over, sometimes they'll say, I can't believe you do this every night. And I have to remind them, no, it's easy because I do it every night. That, what you do is hard. Like, you have to come, and I remember, you know, being a guest on a talk show is far more stressful. I think that hosting a talk show, when I did Letterman, I would think about it for two months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would, like, desperately hope something crazy would happen to me so I'd have a story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I remember the first time I did Letterman, I told a story about how my girlfriend's father had a pet goat and uh and then the next time uh the producer said dave loved the goat story do you have another goat story and i was like i do have another goat story but that's when i realized i'm like that girlfriend i'm gonna have to marry her and i did because <laughs> what were the i mean what were the chances my right. next girlfriend would have a pet goat you know? <laughs> Anything for the material. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Certainly for David Letterman. <laughs> I'm kind of curious how you, and I think that this is where actually acting and improv come in, um, how you walk that line between being prepared for the show and for interviewing your guests, but also making it all seem spontaneous. Yeah, well, I think that we, we think of the work part of the show as that first act. You know, that's usually a closer look. That's what we've been working on all day. That requires a little bit more precision and, you know, certainly writing. And then we have great researchers. We have great segment producers. And they do a wonderful job of preparing me just enough that I'm not ignorant, but also not over-preparing me so that I'm trying to adhere to some blueprint for what we want the interview to be. And look, sometimes it does lay out pretty naturally to you know, it, it parallels the pre-interview they do. But other times, people, you know, they get loose and, and it's fun and, and you just embrace those moments. Like, um, uh, Kristen Milioti was just on the show and, you know, again, the other nice thing about the longer you do the show, the more you kind of learn the kind of guests who are willing to just throw it all out the window. And so once you know they're not married to any agenda they're trying to accomplish, it's so much more fun to do it that way. And I'm not asking you to name names, but I'm curious how you sort of handle a, a challenging guest. Yeah. Like when you feel it's going off the rails, maybe? I, you know, I feel like we do a pretty good job of not having yeah. too many challenging guests. Um, <laughs> we certainly don't have them back. <laughs> And that's a yeah. good way of like, just sort of like, you know, uh, you just sort of like wean it out. But, uh, um, and, and I think we just try to, there's a, there's a kind of difficult guess that's also good TV. Not true. contentious, I, I, I don't know if that's necessarily worth it. But, you know, sometimes you get somebody who's, you know, gives super short answers and then, as the interviewer, you sort of realize, all right, let's see if you're worth your salt. <laughs> you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to keep this alive. There's nothing worse than when you feel like you've asked every question that the segment producer told you about, and my stage manager Steve like holds the time. Sort of, he'll hold a, and when you like run out of questions, and he holds up five minutes, are you like, oh yo 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 yo? Um, but those are, you know, that's that's thrilling and fun. And there are times where I, I 
you know, I can fill that five minutes and I, that's almost more fun than, yeah. than doing it exactly the way you hoped it would go. Um, I want to get to as many audience questions as possible, Great. but I want to talk about some of your work as a producer because it seems like, first of all, it seems like you really like to find and elevate other voices. Um, but I want to start with documentary now because <laughs> it's so Thank crazy you. but brilliant. How like how did you even pitch that? There there isn't a twenty second elevator pitch for that. Well, it was really I. It was a great credit to the fact that Fred already had Portlandia on mm. IFC because Portlandia is another show. Like, how do you pitch Portlandia? Um, you know, we're gonna do a sketch show about a very specific <laughs> Pacific Northwestern <laughs> town. Um, but uh, we had done this sketch called History of Punk on SNL where Fred played a, a British punk rocker named Ian Rubbish and <laughs> the premise was he was the only uh, punk rocker who liked um, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I wrote it with Fred the week she died. And oh. um, it was actually, you know what? I don't care for the lady, but it was a very loving tribute. Yes. Um, <laughs> And uh, and then and then IFC said we'd love to do a show about Ian Rubbish, but then Bill had come in after the show that week and said he had always wanted to do a show because that was we made it look like a documentary about Ian Rubbish and it was really archival and different. It tried to match different shows and different looks from you know seventies English television and. Bill said, I'd love to do a show that was a different documentary like that every week. And then the three of us and Reese Thomas and Alex Bono, who had directed that and directed a lot of the short films at SNL at the time, we basically brought that to IFC and said, we want to do a show called Documentary Now, which is that. And to their credit, they just said, great. And they said, we don't think uh, Documentary Now is a very good title. Is there something else? And we said, no, it has to be Documentary Now. <laughs> <laughs> and like that, at every step of the way, they have the everything, the few things they've asked, we'd be like, no. Because <laughs> I remember we're like, we want to do a whole episode in Spanish. They're like, that isn't great. We're like, okay, but that's what we're going to do. Oh. <laughs> and then we're like, if we're going to do a black and white. They're like, could you not? We're like, no, we, we, do, we can't not. Um, but then I, I just, they, uh, I really want to stress, like, it's been such a cool partnership and they, totally get it and they get the marketing and they get the game of it and we've been so lucky not just that they get it but that Helen Mirren gets the joke and every year Helen Mirren comes in and records the intros like masterpiece theater style jokeless wow. like they're wow. jokeless intros yeah. because so much of documentary now is like not making an easy joke yeah. and so the joke is that Helen Mirren is taking it seriously, and it only works if Helen Mirren gets that that's funny. Um, and we're so lucky that she does. It's so niche upon niche. Oh, you know? it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, um, when, the, uh, when the Nielsen ratings come out, you can't see it. <laughs> like the documentary now and the Nielsen, it's like, it's like blurry. <laughs> Uh, oh, and obviously we should talk about the Amber Ruffin show, which you're mm -hmm. also a producer on. Uh, did Incredible that show. Yep, and that's just Amber and Jenny, yeah. you know. Um, and again, it's just that thing of you see two people, get to work with them every day. Self-starters, they often bring in something that solves a problem before you had a chance to say it was a problem. And so it was just such a natural fit to give them their own show, mm -hmm. to let them. Uh, and we're mostly, you know, we're so lucky that that show exists and is so good, but also that they've managed to do that and stick around at our show too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a question from Patricia Warren. Okay. Uh, been a fan for decades. Love, 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 love your Netflix special Lobby Baby. Thank you very um, much. Are you planning on doing another one soon? I would like to. It's this weird sort of um, gift of the Magi type situation, which is the more kids you have, the more material you have, but in order to tell the material, you have to abandon your children. <laughs> um, because it's just very hard to like go out on the road now. I mean, I and I genuinely, my my kids are such good company now that I'm always sort of weighing that. But I I've, I've been trying to get up in in New York and you know without having to go away for the city and, and do more material. And and I do love doing stand up. It's a totally different muscle and it's really fun. And it's really fun right now to go out with my boys. 
um, in the park because every now and then someone will be like, which one's Lobby Baby? And that's a very, <laughs> it's a very New York thing that people demand to know. Which one's the Lobby Baby? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then my oldest one, Ash, goes, he's the Lobby Baby, I'm the Hospital Baby. <laughs> And it's starting to dawn on him that nobody thinks that's cool. <laughs> also, our, our daughter was born, it was a home birth, a planned home birth, so she was born in a bathtub. So he's like, I'm a lobby, uh, he's lobby, I'm hospital, and our daughter, our, our little sister is a bathtub. And people are like, okay, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Ash, yes. you're a weird family. Most people have all their kids in the same place. <laughs> Uh, we actually have a couple of questions about the sea captain. Oh, great. Um, well, Dale first wants to know, where's Amber? And yeah. are you bringing back the sea captain? The sea captain was very uh, divisive. I would like to bring the sea captain back, but it did feel like he had a really good run. <laughs> and uh, I think we're going to get out while the getting's good. But we have a lot of sea captain art in the office now. Really? Yeah. Well, somebody made a beautiful oil painting of the sea captain and uh, Rihanna. And so that is like a featured, that's a featured painting. There was literally a woman just in the audience one day during Q&A said, I'm a painter and I want to make a painting of the sea captain and his wife. Who do you want the wife to look like? And I said, Rihanna. And it's the most beautiful painting. And they seem very happy together. Yeah. Uh, Stu Ackerman actually, there's two questions, but he wants to know if you have a comment on the sea captain taking over the role of Mr. Krabs. Uh, who's Mr. Krabs? Was uh, on uh, SpongeBob SquarePants? Oh yeah, it, he, he was definitely a, it would be a good fit. I mean, the greatest thing about the Sea Captain was Will Forte was the voice of the Sea yeah. Captain, and it was during the pandemic. And I would just we would write like over the course of the morning we would write in the Sea Captain just randomly, and then I'd have to text Forte and say, "Will you read these lines?" And he would just go. He would like basically get under his bed and like say them into his phone. It was very lo-fi, um, <laughs> but it was kind of the, I mean, look, it was a terrible time, but there was something magical about how the audience forgave a great many, yeah. I don't know, blemishes sort of in the production of television because they understood what was happening. Like they, they knew what you were going through and because they were going through it too. And so there was, it's a, you know, sometimes like, uh, a band can never like catch the sort of magic in the bottle of their first couple of albums. Like I felt weirdly our show got to make our first two albums as our like sixth and seventh yeah. album. Cause all of a sudden it was like year six and seven of the show and, and it became the most sort of li uh, like lo-fi version of it. And it was really exciting and, and cool to just basically say at one in the afternoon, hey, the sea captain painting is gonna talk from now on. <laughs> and everybody's like, all right, bud, whatever you wanna do. So. <laughs> Do you keep some of that spirit alive? No, we you're tried back. very yeah. hard to. I mean, some of it is just, you know, I think the audience would burn down the place. Like we, you know, we started making Wally our cue card guy an active participant in the show because there was nobody else around. Yeah, see? <laughs> Created a monster. And now, <laughs> and now I think like if literally if it's two shows without Wally, people on Twitter are like, what happened to Wally? <laughs> Release the Wally cut. <laughs> Well, that reminds me, you didn't answer Dale's question, where's Amber? Oh, Amber, right now? I wonder where Amber is, but probably in New York City. Yeah, we're on yes. hiatus, so I know I try not to keep too, too close to tabs on my writers when they're not. I actually asked her if there was anything I could say that might embarrass you, mm -hmm. and she told me what your favorite movie of all time is. What did she say? She said in Bruges. Yeah, she's right. Okay, and yeah. I love that movie. In Bruges is the best. I'm so I, excited that there's a... I, that, that, I know. Farrell and Gleason are back, baby. I was like, this is not embarrassing. I love that movie. And she just said, you're both wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best. It's such a good movie. I'm so excited for, yeah. The, the new in Bruges 2. Yeah. Um, I, but Stu's other question was, how challenging was it to convince the network that a talk show should have a political point of view when traditionally they had been neutral? So this was a really lovely thing. When we started doing the show, there was an element in the early days of testing to some degree, right? They would come and say, you know, we basically, we did some testing and people like this and they don't like that. And, you know, in the early days when our show was just trying to be a talk show, I think, it was just sort of nobody knew what the show was. So something, people's like, 
a really funny desk bit people would like, but they wouldn't necessarily like the next desk bit we did. Like there was no connectivity to the show. And, you know, we sort of found our way naturally to doing a closer look. And immediately from sort of friends and family and even people on the street, I got great feedback on that. Like, mm. oh, I really like that. I feel like, and, and people were saying, oh, I could tell that's what you are natural doing. That's what you want to be doing. And then though, the really cool thing was basically NBC said, hey, that's what we're seeing too. Like basically we, and so it, we didn't need to hear that from NBC to keep doing it. But I think the fact that NBC heard that meant that they were, they celebrated it as well. So we've never had any issue with them. I think, I do think we live in a time now where, and again, it was different in, in talk shows, you know, a couple decades ago, but I think people now know that people with jobs like this have opinions and they yeah. kind of like to know what they are. I think they can smell inauthenticity. And so being your real self, especially when you have a show that's your name, right? You're not, I mean, all the jokes we made about it, like it is, I am Seth Meyers. I'm not <laughs> a good enough actor to play a different version of it. <laughs> Does anyone do impressions of you? Uh, N- Bill Hader is always like, of course. buddy, buddy. Like, cause I talk with my hands a lot. Although I feel like I haven't been done it tonight. So. <laughs> Not a point. We have a question from Jesse. Um, wants to know if there was ever a low point you experienced where you were going to give it all up but kept going, and how did you persevere? I do think it was like that compare and despair era of my time at the show where it wasn't working as a cast member, and I didn't know if I was ready to just be a writer on the show and give up being on camera and I you know that was the low point as far as how I got through it I don't you know I I got lucky in that I found a way to do both but I don't know if I hadn't got weekend update I don't know what I would have done I don't know Mm -hmm. if I would have been willing to stay at the show as just a writer and then if that had happened I don't know what my next chapter would have been so um, but I definitely did have a low point I'm very I'm happy that even though internally I think I had a a great amount of jealousy that I wasn't very proud of, I don't think I shared that with people around me, which is why I have managed to to stay really close friends with all Mm. those people. I actually want to ask about that, and there's no way to to word this question without sounding like I'm like sucking up to you or something. But you do have a reputation for being one of the nicest people oh, thank in this you. business, <laughs> and this is not a kind business all the time. Um, how do you sort of maintain, you know, the positive attitude and the kindness? I feel very lucky, and I don't take it for granted that I got to do the thing that I beyond dreamed I would get to do. And I also, you know, get to work with people who make me laugh all day. And it would just be a shame to not be able to share how good it all makes me feel. It's also, I remember at SNL, the ones that always stuck out to me were Derek Jeter and Paul McCartney. Like when they were there, Everybody has to tell them something, but it's nothing they haven't heard before, right? Like, and a lot of times it's just people needing to tell them they were there when they did a thing. You know, like, hey, remember when you hit that home run on November 1st? I was there. And my Derek Jeter's got to be like, that's great. <laughs> you know, they're because what else? But they were, uh, I always remember, like, those two people, especially the most patient, lovely, and I, I always remember being like, if Paul McCartney can be nice, I think you can fucking be nice. Because <laughs> you're no so Paul good. McCartney Myers. <laughs> we have a couple questions about your children's book. Okay. Um, Mar- is it Mary Jo? Nancy, Nancy Jo, I'm so sorry. Hi, Nancy Jo. What first inspired you to write a children's book, and how did your children influence writing? I think, uh, very sadly, I wanted to write a children's book because I, my ego was feeling very bruised by how much my kids were enjoying other people's children's <laughs> books. Um, and so I was like, ah, dad, you know you're dead, because it turns out my kids don't watch A Closer Look. They don't have any appreciation for uh, the kind of writer I am. Um, 
One of them just doesn't like politics, and the other one's a Fox News guy. Um, <laughs> it's the lobby baby, right? He's the lobby yeah, baby, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like, I was born in a lobby. I didn't need any help from the government. I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> I like how he's a grizzled old man. Yeah, he's very here. grizzled. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, and then it was, but so I had this idea. I did want to, you know, uh, and I worked with this wonderful um, uh, editor named Margaret, and she and I talked about writing about fear. And, but the fun thing was, uh, before I put it down on paper, was telling the story to my boys at night. And um, at the time, the six-year-old was the only one sort of old enough to give helpful notes. But um, he was. He'd be like, that's too scary. Or he'd be like, I like this and, and like that. And, uh, and then uh, I wrote it, and they liked it. And, uh, but it's not their favorite. <laughs> I don't quite know why, but it's like I don't. I think if I'm, I'm trying to like come up with excuses, I think you know it like it, it, there's a story to it and an arc, and like I think because since they know so much of it is about how it ends, and I think since they know how it ends, they're like, eh, we're good. <laughs> um, and every time they show it to people, they just want to show the uh, dedication to Aww. show people that their names are in it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, that doesn't mean you wrote it, right? Like. <laughs> um, and finally, we have a question from Robin. Uh, wants to know, what's your mom's favorite cocktail this season? Oh, my mom, uh, Hendrix uh, Gin and Tonic. Mm. Uh, yeah. And there's some, now there's like some new like fancy Hendrix, like uh, botanicals, I, I think. Yeah. Like they're like, it's like different labels. And um, I will say, I've mentioned multiple times on the show how much my mom likes the gin and tonic and Hendrix sent like a big old box. Wow. And uh, so now, yeah, my mom's a big fan. Cause we just, <laughs> they sent it to the show and I just immediately like changed the address and sent it up to her in New Hampshire. And she wow. was, yeah, there'll be a real brand loyalty for her for a while. <laughs> those are the perks. Yeah, those are the perks. Yeah. Um, is there anyone you haven't yet had as a, a guest that like is sort of the dream guest? Maybe someone who doesn't do interviews? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was, um, uh, we tried for a long time uh, for Rihanna and then doing day drinking where Heather was great and then having having Letterman on the show a couple times yeah. that was really important um, you know I'd love to have Conan on the show because obviously Jimmy's been on and, and so Conan's sort of like the missing of the you know yeah. the four of us that have done it um, I gotta be honest when I saw you know Julia Roberts and George Clooney doing a new movie yeah like, come on Come on, late night, you guys. You never had either of them? I haven't had any, neither of them. What? Yeah, I mean, I was waiting for them to, like, do something big. They've asked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, I don't know, what's the project? I'm like, oh. <laughs> with this. <laughs> I think the time is right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, again, I want to congratulate you. It's You're starting your ninth season now, right? I guess so. Yeah. It blends together. That's the thing, is I will say you have a much better sense of SNL because that you have the full yeah. summer off and it feels like school. You know, it, yeah. like the season ends and there, there's no like season finale uh, when you do late night. It's just like life. It's like I feel like one day. It's like the way people talk about your kids. You're like, <laughs> it goes by so fast. <laughs> I mean, if the internet is accurate, you just started your ninth season in August. That's right. Okay. Oh, February. We started our show in February, so that's that's when okay, our new season so starts. Yeah. So don't the internet trust, is don't not trust the internet. If I've learned anything from corrections, <laughs> I was say, put it on corrections. They're pretty shoddily researched a bunch of people. <laughs> well, I want to urge everyone to get their Hendrix gin to watch in yeah. Bruges. Um, such a good movie. How could you not like that movie? How can you not? Can I just say something real quick? Yeah. You are excellent at this. Okay. Can I hear that? Okay. I mean, no, you, you, when you're asking me, when you're asking me, like, what my tips are for interviewing, I'm just like, I'm learning them. <laughs> I'm learning them as we go here. Thank you. I don't take compliments well, so I appreciate that. <laughs> I don't either, but... Um, yeah. no. no, and especially I told him before coming in, This I was actually really nervous about tonight because when you, it's different when you interview someone who's a good interviewer. You know, they know all the tricks. So I cannot thank you enough for being here. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. This was really lovely. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Woo.